All right, so the last time we took a look at what would CA do after Total Warhammer, we looked at GW's own successor franchise being 40k. And while that was fun, the only other mainline franchise left from Gang's Workshop would be Age of Sigmar, and doing that would be a complete waste of time given that 90% of it would literally just be changing the names of things. Instead, we're going to take a look at the, another fantasy series, and one that would be my own personal dream pairing, The Elder Scrolls. So kick back, grab a nice big old glass of skooma, and let's get right into it. So just like last time, I would argue that there is a ton of reasons to do a Total War Elder Scrolls, but let's start with one of the more obvious ones. It would be fairly easy for them to do this time around. Total Warhammer was a brand new thing for CA to handle in a lot more ways than you might be picturing. Not only was it their first delve into magic and monsters and the like, which might not sound like much to you, but the historical games never had to worry about how to handle a 300 ton dinosaur smashing its way through a bunch of skeletons that crumble when their leadership fails only to be targeted by a bipedal pirate ship with a cannon for an arm. Another new thing that they had to deal with, and that I've really begun to lean into lately, is the asymmetry of different factions. So the Vampire Counts, Tomb Kings, and Vampire Coast all play completely different from one another, and those are the three undead factions, the group who should have the most in common with one another. On top of all that, there was a pretty big backlash from some when Total Warhammer was first announced, specifically from the hardcore historical-only fanboys, and yet, I feel like the fantasy team has likely more than justified their existence, and Total Warhammer routinely tops the sales charts now whenever a DLC comes out for it. Case in point, when The Warden and the Paunch was out, it was the number one selling anything on Steam the day it was announced. All this is to say, CA knows how to handle a series like Elder Scrolls now, they've already proven they know what they're doing with the Total Warhammer series, and they've already demonstrated they've got the community on their side for such an endeavor. Also, not unlike last time when we were talking about 40k, money is definitely on the table for such a game. While Warhammer 40k is likely a hair more lucrative, The Elder Scrolls is far from a minor name, with a little over a million copies of Morrowind sold, 10 million of Oblivion sold, and a ridiculous 30 million copies of Skyrim sold, that being for both editions combined. Just like with Total Warhammer, the world of Nern also lends itself extremely well to multiple editions, especially if the borders go beyond Tamriel. Just like Games Workshop works, there is a huge breadth of lore to pick from as well, so while we do have the obvious core 10 races, the Argonians, Bretons, Dark Elves, High Elves, Imperials, Khajiit, Nords, Orcs, Redguard, and Wood Elves, they also make for quite a lot of easy lore on its own with things like Dwarven Autonoma, the Sloat and their Necromantic creations, the Falmer and their Poisonous Beasts, the Daedra Gods along with their Denizens and Followers, and numerous other non-playable races could make for some easy and obvious content options. And I am genuinely only just touching on the tip of the iceberg here. If CA really wanted to, I could think of dozens upon dozens of faction possibilities that would be incredibly easy to justify the inclusion of. But maybe you don't care about any of that. How CA makes money is not my concern, gameplay as you say. And once again, the sheer variety of factions and cultures available comes to the rescue here. Let's take a look at the three major elven factions in the current lore, these being the Dunmer, the Altmer, and the Bosmer, or the Dark Elves, High Elves, and Wood Elves respectively in the more common tongue. The Dunmer have a focus on destruction magic, once held up three of their own as living gods, and still believe in the ancient ways, notably in communicating with the dead, taking slaves for their economy, and sanctioned assassination being a viable political path. Dunmer crafting is focused on using organic materials in their armors and buildings, which means resources typically need to be hunted down and physically gathered in order to use them, which leaves their uh, cities with also a vaguely alien aesthetic. The High Elves, in comparison, also boast powerful magical talents, though they tend to focus theirs more on creative pursuits, such as alchemy and enchantment. Their gods are of the more intangible variety, though they consider themselves to be the far most cultured of all elven factions, eschewing assassination and slavery in favor of duels and debates. Their architecture and armor is extravagant and elegant, using expensive and rare materials such as moonstone and volcanic glass. The Wood Elves, in comparison to the other two, are utterly focused on ranged and self-combat, and worship nature itself to such a degree that they are literally forbidden from consuming plants, and are thus exclusively carnivorous. For them, the cultures of their other two elven kin are a farce, and the Wood Elves worship dead gods that eventually went on to become nature itself. The only tradition to be respected by them is the Wild Hunt, a time in which all elves and creatures within their borders become vicious killing machines, and that Wild Hunt is directly responsible for every savage beast to ever exist in all of Tamriel. 
While the other elven girls just create and build, Bosmer architecture, and I use that term very loosely, is literally just living high up in the treetops, protected and armed exclusively with the bones and leathers of their prey. These are the three cultures who should have the most in common with one another, and as you can see, they wouldn't play anywhere near the same way as one another. But not only is the lore of the Elder Scrolls deep, it's also very weird. The Wood Elves being Obliviate Carnivores might have already tipped you off, but if you've played Morrowind, you're already aware of how weird and interesting the Dark Elf culture can be. As interesting as the setting would be, I actually thought of this more because of how interesting the gameplay could be. Unlike Warhammer Fantasy, The Elder Scrolls was never a war game, it has always been an RPG series, and blending that concept into the Total War series could make for a, a game that is unique to Total War as Total Warhammer was to the series in the first place. Imagine if your lords and heroes didn't just have traits on level up, but actual attributes and skills to level up. Imagine if you've got a great sword wielding melee lord. On level up, you might throw a point into strength to boost weapon damage, or maybe into endurance to have him tank a little bit more damage. An archery based sneaky lord, you're probably going to be focused on agility or maybe some speed to let them flee from other combat characters. An illusion based magic caster, well now you're probably going to be focused on willpower and intelligence. Perks from the games could also be very easy to toss into such a system as well, allowing you to really, really focus your lord into specific niches. Continuing with the reasons to do it, it would slot in perfectly with Total War's stance on modding. Mod support is a core tenet of the Elder Scrolls series to the point where it would utterly trounce the amount of mod support that something like Total Warhammer could ever even hope to have. Likewise, mod support has always been a major part of Total War as well. So just imagine the kind of amazing opportunities we could have with a fantasy title from CA that isn't beholden to things like Games Workshop only content on the mod page for it. And even though The Elder Scrolls has never had an official strategy game, the sheer breadth of its lore means that it's actually fairly easy to come up with rosters for most of the potential factions and then, even if CAA had to invent a few, because The Elder Scrolls isn't based on a tabletop war game, there's not really any concern if CAA chooses to add something that could potentially affect a perceived meta. But there's another reason that only just recently cropped up months after I started writing the draft for this video. Microsoft's acquisition of ZeniMax, and by extension, Bethesda. Now I assume more than a few of you probably have a raised eyebrow right now, given that Microsoft doesn't own CAA. Sega does. Well, let me explain myself. ZeniMax, the former owners of Bethesda, never really had much incentive to produce a PC-only strategy game as they were a multi-platform developer, developer with only a few teams at their disposal. So taking a team off of the mainline multi-platform title to work on a side project for only a single platform would be a tremendously poor business decision for ZeniMax. But Microsoft isn't as beholden to such an issue. If anything, they want more games on their specific platforms, PC in particular, and to maximize utility of their recently acquired IPs. And who better to involve with that than the developers they used the last time they wanted an RTS done up for one of their mainline games. If you're unaware, Creative Assembly already worked with Microsoft on Halo Wars 2, a game that not only performed great, but that Microsoft specifically complimented CA on, and even went on to use its lore for the upcoming Halo Infinite. Needless to say, they have an awesome working relationship already set up from that. So if I'm Microsoft right now, I'm already ringing up Sega to see if they have any interest in working together again, doing up a total war game that will just print money for both parties involved. I can't imagine much resistance for either party on that front. So let's play pretend for a moment and imagine that such a pairing is both welcomed and created. What would it look like? Well, it was really hard to settle on a specific pick because there are so many great time periods and locations to pick from. But I suppose the most logical thing to do would be to pick a time frame first, and to me the most logical pick is set roughly a few years before the Oblivion Crisis, approximately 200 years prior to Skyrim. Why then specifically? Because it still leaves many crucial characters around that would be awesome to see. The Emperor, the real one, not the fake thing that we got in Skyrim, is still alive at the start of the invasion, the Tribunal hasn't disappeared, the Cult of the Mythic Dawn still exists, the Oblivion Gates would be about to pop up everywhere, it would be an awesome time frame for a strategy game, and I would just tweak it ever so slightly so that rather than following the games to a T, the history splits from here, no different than what we have in Total Warhammer really. But it actually kind of works better in the Elder Scrolls case because the manipulation of time and history is something that's very, very common to the games. If you're familiar with uh, Daggerfall, for example, literally every single one of its endings, even though they are mutually exclusive, are all considered canon because they are allowed to disrupt the time frame of the games. So that's the when covered, so what about the where and the who? Well, this is sort of a related point. I would set it in central and northeastern Tamriel. There's a really simple logic to this. 
It's where the last three games have been from, so Skyrim, Cyrodiil, and Morrowind are all in that corner of the world, and would therefore be the most familiar location for new players to be introduced to. It also gives C8 oodles of factions to pick from. You've got House Dagoth and the Rash Vampires, the Tribunal Temple and Morrowind, the Cyrodiilic Empire, the Mythic Dawn, the Nords of Skyrim, Manny Marco and the Cult of Worms, her scene in the Blood Moon Hunters, the Force War and the Falmer, the Volkahar Vampires, the three vampiric clans and Morrowind, numerous bandit camps. Like literally these are just the ones I can think of just off the top of my head. Imagine how many more options there would be if CA really wanted to get into it. And as I said, there is a ton of opportunity here if CA decides to pull the trigger on this. So put a crossbow to my head and make me pick four core factions in a pre-order bonus. I'd say the Tribunal Temple would be the first core faction. Full disclosure, Morrowind's my favorite game of all time, so their inclusion on this list is probably slightly painted by that fact. Anyways, the Tribunal Temple would have Vivek as one legendary lord and Almalexia as the other. Both represent literal demigods and are worshipped as such by most of the Dunmer of Morrowind. Vivek would be the more combat orientated of the two and would have access to the buoyant armagers as a special unit. Almalexia, in comparison, would be more of an empire builder and a support lord but would also have access to the hands of Almalaxia, being the best of the best among all High Ordinators. That's one faction down, what about another more sinister threat? Well, for that we can turn to House Dagoth, they would be led of course by Dagoth Ur, with the second slot going to Dagoth Endus, his brother. The former is a psychotic demigod, while the latter is a psychotic monstrosity, so the two are really cool, interesting options there. House Dagoth would be focused on corruption and have the objective of eventually rebuilding the Nimidium, and would be among the coolest looking units in the entire setting. Our third faction would of course be the Cyrodiilic Empire. While the Oblivion Crisis actually happened a few years after the battle between the Neverreen and House Dagoth, we're going to tweak things slightly and say Maroon's Dagoth just went ahead and jumped the gun by six years and launched his attack around the same time. We'll assume that Dear Old Empire still gets shanked, making the two legendary lord options Okado and Joffrey. The former would be a battle mage and would lead the Elder Council, while the latter is a warrior who would lead the blades. Their objective would be to get Morrowind and Skyrim back under their control after handling the Oblivion Crisis. Our last core faction would be the big boys up north, the Nords. While you don't get to see it much in game, during the Oblivion Crisis the Nords were hit particularly hard during the Oblivion Crisis invasion, but they used the chaos to try and wrest some control back to themselves. During the Crisis they actually invaded parts of Morrowind, itself being part of the same empire that the Nords were supposed to belong to, and several holds decided to cast off their obligations to the Empire down below. Now, understand this wouldn't be the Stormcloaks, as it should be noted that basically the entirety of Elder Scrolls V's plot would be completely irrelevant here, it's like 200 years down the road. As for who to put in for Legendary Lords, this would actually have to be all CA. See, we have High Kings and Leaders of the Reachmen for basically the entire history of Tamriel, except for the time of the Oblivion Crisis. Go figure. As for what they would be motivated by, in both cases you would presume that they would be tempted to or get themselves unshackled from the Empire, as well as take over the entirety of Morrowind back from the Elves. So I guess we can finish on the pre-order faction then, which would be the forces of Mehrunes Dagon himself. One faction would be the Order of the Mythic Dawn, led by Mankar Cameron, and the other would be the Megas Volar, led by Lord Dregas Volar. If you've played Oblivion, Mankar Cameron is the chief antagonist in that game, a mage who faithfully serves Mehrunes Dagon and has been rewarded extremely well as a result. The latter is a Dremora Lord from Morrowind who wields the last Daedric Crescent weapon and is implied to have been one of the Dremora who assaulted the Battlespire in another game, which was yet another one of Mehrunes Dagon's invasion attempts. For each of their objectives, they'd both be focused on getting Mehrunes Dagon's favor, which would likely involve widespread destruction and killing. Like I said, Total War Elder Scrolls would be my own personal dream pairing. Maybe you don't agree with it, and that's a-okay, but I do sincerely think that this would be an extremely good pairing for CA to look into next, debatably an even better pairing than Total War 40k. Anyways, that's it for this particular video. Did you like the idea? Did you have some questions or concerns about it? Was there something else you would do instead? Let me know down in the comments down below. I am hoping to do some more of these as time goes on, but these particular videos take forever to get done, so they're not going to be a regular thing here and there. There'll be more when I can get them wrapped up each time. Anyways, I want to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.